Today's episode is brought to you by the Tax Defense Group. Tax season is here, and that means that it's time to file your taxes. There's good news. If you're a W-2 employee, you can save half off your tax filing. All you have to do is call the Tax Defense Group before April 15, 2020, and mention that you saw this ad on UCAST Studios. Millions of Americans will get money back after they file, and you can be one of them. Call the Tax Defense Group today at 800-850-7973. That number again is 800-850-7973, and you can visit them online at thetaxdefensegroup.com. And another sponsor for today's episode is Writer Junkie. Are you looking to make more money in 2020? One of the best ways to do that is by having a new resume that can help you get that dream job. Writer Junkie offers affordable, well-written resumes for the low cost of $145. They'll even throw in a cover letter for no additional charge. All you have to do is mention that you saw this ad on UCAS Studios and they'll get right to work. Call Writer Junkie today at 805-587-7966 and you can visit them online at writerjunkie.com. Hi, welcome to Talks About. This is Marcus, and today I'm joined by Trevor Lane with Lakers Nation. Trevor, thank you for coming on. Hey, no problem. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so how have, uh, how have things been going since last time we talked? Obviously, I think, yeah, how have you feel like the Lakers have done since all the drama of Magic leaving and all of that craziness? Oh, man, has it really been that long? Um, yeah, look, it's uh, look, the Lakers have done really, really well since, since then. Things have been surprisingly stable. I mean, look, there's still tons of, like, you know, the, the trade deadline had a ton of rumors, and, and now we've got all the buyout market rumors and all that kind of stuff. But relatively speaking, this has been pretty smooth sailing for a Los Angeles Lakers season. Um, we're not hearing a whole lot about the front office uh, the, and any kind of you know issues going on there, or any kind of drama um, within the, the team itself. It seems like all the guys are really on the same page and playing for each other and all of that. So, uh, you know, it's still been a very exciting season. But compared to where we were, if that was the, the last time that we talked, uh, man, the, the ship seems to have been righted uh, quite a bit since then. Yeah, I mean, I, like, yeah, especially, I mean, you look back, so what, Magic Johnson, he quit, was that like April 28th, something like that, of 2019? That. So, I mean, it's been nearly a year, like 10 months. And yeah, I mean, if someone had said that from that point when Magic left, virtually there would be no drama, I think most people would have thought that was shocking. I mean... Yeah, especially, you know, over the summer, everyone was saying, you know, oh, well, you know, the Lakers couldn't even get Ty Lue and they had to get Frank Vogel mm-hmm. and Jason Kidd's going to stab him in the back and this and that. And, you know, the the Ram by are terrible. And I think one of the last times we spoke to, um, we brought up, I think I literally saw on the Cowherd show that day or the herd that he said something about um, there's a shadow executive that's going to take over the Lakers and that. It could be Jerry West or Bob Myers or something like that. And Oh, yeah. I remember that. I, I just remember yeah. that take was just so egregious because it was so not correct. It was just so wrong. And, dude, yeah, yeah honestly, kind of like what you're saying, I mean, there's been really no chemistry issues. There really hasn't been any drama. I mean, obviously, you know, Kobe Bryant passed away, and that was obviously a huge blow to the team. But Sure. That wasn't dramatic. Every news story that that I'm reading, and I mean, you're, I mean, you guys produce a lot of the content, even too, about the Lakers. Like, it doesn't sound like there's any backfighting. It doesn't sound like anybody's complaining or being passive aggressive. It sounds like everybody actually kind of likes each other. No, yeah, yeah. That was you know Kobe's passing. That's a that's drama, but that's a different kind of of drama, right? I mean, we we're talking about the kind of drama where it's. You know, almost soap opera esque drama with with what we saw from the Lakers previously, and that's what's what's really gone away. Um, certainly, Brian's passing and his memorial is is uh, coming up in the city of Los Angeles coming up uh, on on Monday on the the twenty fourth. Uh, but that was a that was certainly dramatic and and heartbreaking and difficult to deal with in its in its own right. But in terms of the team itself and the structure and the you know the the front office and how all that's working, uh, there hasn't been drama there, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing that they have that kind of of stability, even if it means we have a little bit less to talk about. Being able to to talk about a team that does seem to have all their ducks in a row and and seem to be heading in the right direction, that's been a, a real nice change this season. And I don't necessarily want to like I guess crap on Magic Johnson, but I mean. Could you kind of make a little bit of an argument that he kind of actually was like a huge source of the drama? I mean, ever since he's been gone, the Lakers team as a whole seems pretty like stable, I would say. 
Sure. I mean, when you look at, you know, so the various rumors that were coming out, there were all kinds of things that were leaking out from the Lakers while Magic was there. And now it seems like the leaks are a lot less frequent. And so then that makes you think, huh, well, maybe Magic was the source of some of those things. Uh, But again, though, he's Magic Johnson, right? Like at the end of the day, this is the guy that, I mean, a lot of Lakers fans, myself included, grew up watching, right? He's the guy, he he is the guy that, that connected me with the Lakers initially. So he's always going to be Magic Johnson. Even if he's even if we look at his as his turn running the team as something that uh, that was a failure, something that didn't work out the way we'd hoped it had, and something that that maybe changed our perception of who he is a little bit. He's still always going to be Magic Johnson. He's always going to be that that Showtime guy. He's always going to hold a special spot in the hearts of Lakers fans. And so, I, you know, it's it didn't work out that well for him running the Lakers. But he's uh, I don't think he's diminished how beloved he is by by the Lakers fan base. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I hundred percent agree with you that I feel like when it came to the Magic Johnson Rob Palenka split or fight or however you want to describe it, I mean. Like like what you just said, magic is magic. I mean, he could have, he could run the Knicks, and it still wouldn't destroy his legacy if he did terribly there. I mean, with Rob Plinkett, well, I don't know. The Knicks are pretty bad. Yeah, they they are bad, and obviously they they always hurt people's reputation. But I feel like if Magic was running the Knicks for three years badly, he could walk away, and like you said, he would he would survive and be fine. I mean, somebody like Rob Plinkett. I mean, if Magic had got what he wanted and forced Rob Plink out, obviously Rob Plink. I mean, he's a incredibly successful guy that's made millions of dollars it's not like he's going to be homeless but it's really doubtful that he would have gotten at least i don't think one year ago if magic if he went to genie and he said it's either me or rob palinka i believe at that point if rob palinka had gotten fired i don't know for sure if he would have gotten another gm position i feel like after this season if something were to happen where the lakers were to fire him i definitely think some other team would pick him up don't you think yeah, I think so. And and there's always going to be the question marks around Rob now, right? Is it how much of the current team being put together, how much of it was Rob Palenka, how much of it was LeBron, how much of it was was AD? And, and you know, that, that criticism is always going to be there. There's no way to really get away from that. It's just like all the people who say, oh, well, you know, Kobe has five championships, but he doesn't win them without Shaq and he doesn't win them without Powell and, and that type of thing. So there's always going to be question marks around, around Rob Palenka. Is it just he's a good GM or is it – you know, he's a good GM who happened to have LeBron James and that's and that, you know, pushed him to another level. Uh, we'll still see what he does with the bio market and everything. But, yeah, I think I think you're right. I think he has he's at least I don't want to say he's totally proven himself, but he's pr- but he's proven enough to where you can say that he he knows what he's doing. Right. This isn't he's not this this bumbling fool who doesn't understand the salary cap and completely messed up the Lakers trade to Anthony Davis and ruined their shot at Kawhi Leonard and and that was you know that was the picture that was being painted at one point last summer I think he's proven that he's not that guy he is a very smart guy and I think you're right I think that if something were to happen and that's you know not the way that things are headed right now but if something were to happen I do think he would get another shot somewhere else so let's say theoretically it's you know July whatever 6th of 2021. If Rob Plinka somehow, if he, like, let's say he's the GM, so which I definitely believe he will be. If Giannis were to come to the Lakers in the summer of 2021, could you say that Rob Plinka, in a sense, had the most successful stretch, at least in modern basketball, in terms of being a GM? If when he came to the team in February 2017, we had Luol Deng and Timothy Mozgov and basically the worst record I think we've ever had, right? If he went from that to four and a half years later, he brought in LeBron, Davis, Giannis, and potentially a title. Wouldn't that have to be one of the greatest runs ever for a GM in his first four and a half years? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's hard to get much better than that. If you're talking about bringing in you know, players of that caliber, That's uh, that would be hard to match, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I've really been thinking about with Rob Plinka, like I feel like especially recently or i'm trying to remember when he when it was announced that he became the vp of present operations was that like in january or was that like in uh, december yeah right around then i mean i felt like that was something that in some regards really wasn't like spoken about a lot i mean it's one thing for the mainstream sports media to not praise the lakers because obviously they get more clicks when they crap all over the lakers and you know they do things like on first take which to me, it doesn't even make sense where they have something where it's like the Clippers lose back-to-back road games 
And then they have people come out and say, oh, well, they're definitely going to beat the Lakers. It's like, well, the Lakers just won a road game against the Nuggets, which are the number two seed in the West. And then, like, the Clippers lose back-to-back games, and you're going with that take. The Clippers are still better than the Lakers. But regardless, mm-hmm. like, yeah, there's a lot of – I think there's a lot of money to be made in, like, anti-Laker, like, propaganda, I guess you could almost say, from the mainstream sports media. And, like, I just thought it was interesting for Rob Plinka that, like, I mean, this whole season he's done really well, and I feel like – there's been like almost no praise of him at all. Like, I think it's been like, at least from the mainstream sports media, where there's like never anybody that says, oh, well, Rob Plank actually did a pretty good job. It's always just nothing about him. And I kind of think, I don't know, I guess that kind of rubs me the wrong way. Like, I, I mean, I, I don't know Rob Plank personally at all. I've never spoken to him or anything, but I just kind of look at where the team is now and it's just so much better than it was three years ago. I mean, three years ago, that's one thing I've, I've noticed too about, um, you know, the, the all the games are being played on Spectrum of Kobe's, you know, just Kobe's career. And when I was watching, I forgot when it was, I guess two weeks ago, when they're replaying his last game, I mean, I'm sure you remember that game as well. I mean, I watched it in real time, and then I watched the whole replay whenever it was replayed. Like, that team was so terrible. Like, four years ago, we were horrible. We were like, I, I'm trying to think of a really crappy team. We're like where the Warriors are right now. Like, four years ago, we were horrible, and now it's... It's had a total reversal of fortune. Yeah, and you know your your point about like Rob Plinka doesn't get much credit for this. That's you know a lot of that is the LeBron effect, right? Like if if LeBron if Plinka had drafted whatever like like Lonzo Bi and all, and I know these aren't all you know his draft picks, but if Lonzo Bi and, and you know Brandon Ingram and uh, and, and another pick uh, had really panned out, like let's say they kept their number four pick this year. They selected somebody, you know, whoever they wound, would have wound up taking. Uh, let's say it was Darius Garland or whoever, and that player blows up. In addition to all these other players, all popped, and suddenly the Lakers have all this young talent, and they're this kind of exciting upstart team in, in the NBA uh, that's maybe not quite a favorite, not dominant, but they're they're one of those teams that, that looks like they're going to be in the mix in a few years. Those are the kinds of teams that like like pundits will will get behind and they'll say, oh, well, look at their cap sheet. It's clean for, you know, for so long and they can make the, all these different moves and look at all the look at the way Rob Palenka has positioned them. Look at, you know, if he'd made, swung a bunch of moves to get draft picks and things like that. But that's not really how this team has been built. This team was built around, OK, we've got LeBron James. And now let's do everything we can to put a team around him. And naturally, veterans are going to want to come there. So that you get you get a discounted sense of what Rob Palenka's actual talent is, right? Because you say, oh, well, they just got Danny Green because LeBron's there. Um, they just got DeMarcus Cousins because, you know, who obviously hasn't played this season, but they got him because he wanted to play with Anthony Davis. And um, and so that's kind of maybe taken away some of the shine from Rob Palenka. But I think my bigger point is, does he care? I I don't I don't think so. Um, I don't think it it matters. I think it's it's a good thing that people aren't talking about Rob Palenka all the time because if they were, they'd be talking about you know what what to blame him for. Right now, he's got a great team that's got LeBron, that's got Anthony Davis, that's got all of these pieces, and if that means that some of the credit is going to fall elsewhere, well, that's just the nature of the beast. That's that's the way it's going to go, um, and I don't think that. That matters to Rob Palenka one bit. I don't think that he's the type of guy who needs to be standing in the spotlight. Uh, the one thing I can tell you about Rob Palenka is my very first interaction with Rob Palenka ever was years ago. The Lakers were playing the Suns, and it was the second game of the season, and uh, and we were sitting out uh, just watching warm-ups. It was the second game of the season, and we were talking about how uh, we, we he stopped by and we started chatting about how the Lakers really needed to to get going and win one and he was like visibly stressed, like he was nervous about how badly the Lakers needed to win this to win this game and it was the second game of the season because they had, they had dropped the season opener that year, and uh, and it was just remarkable to me that like he's he's not just there as as this you know this stone cold general manager that's gonna you know always try to say and do the right things like no he he is legitimately invested in this team even way back then when he was uh, that was his first season as the gm so um so it was pretty cool to to see that he's uh he's a, an interesting guy and i think that as time goes on i think lakers fans will will learn to like him more and more and more even if you can't see his fingerprints all over everything quite as clearly as some other general managers around the league so something I want to talk a little bit about, and I know that this debate has probably kind of died down, I guess, more recently, but this idea that 
for the Lakers is their offer for Anthony Davis mm-hmm. that they if they went with offering Brandon Ingram over Kuzma and that the Lakers fought harder to keep Kuzma than they did Ingram. Do you actually believe that that was the case? That the no. Lakers so do you think that the Pelicans were like we absolutely want Ingram. There's no deal without Ingram and that do you think the Lakers said all right, well at least let us keep Kuzma and the Pel- then they were able to work that part out or yeah, yeah. Everything that I've heard is that that's it's the latter scenario that you described. Um, it's not. It wasn't something where like it would make no sense for it to even be this type of situation, right? It w- the Pelicans didn't go to the Lakers and say, "Okay, well, um, we're going to give you Anthony Davis. We'll give you this star player, our our guy that we've had since his rookie year. We're going to give him to you." Um, and we just want some of your young players, but we're going to let you pick who you get to hang on to. Just give us whatever whatever three you feel like giving us, and then, and then we'll we'll be good. No, that's not the way this was going to play out. I mean, look, the Pelicans would have their – the Pelicans, I'm, I'm sure, wanted all of them. They wanted all of the young players, and I, I believe Brandon Ingram was a non-negotiable because of course he is. Of course he would be a non-negotiable. If you're the Pelicans and you do this deal and you don't get Brandon Ingram, I mean, my gosh, they'd be – uh, people would be ridiculing them. And, and so I, I believe that he needed to be in it. And uh, it, it was a couple of months ago, Bobby Marks from ESPN was reporting the, the exact same thing. He was hearing the same thing, that, that Brandon Ingram needed to be in the deal. It wasn't a situation where the Lakers got to pick, okay, we're going to keep either Kuzma or Ingram and we choose Kuzma. That wasn't the situation at all. It was more the Lakers said, okay, well, we'll give you Ingram, we'll give you Lonzo, we'll give you Josh Hart, but we're going to hang on to, to Kuzma. Let us keep him, the other guys, there there was no there was no moving off of that. So I, I hear that all the time. I see it online because people are frustrated with the season that, that Kyle Kuzma has had. And, I, and the knee-jerk reaction is, oh, the Lakers should have kept Brandon Ingram. That wasn't a possibility. I mean, that's one thing that I've also found very fascinating about the Kuzma. I don't even know how you want to describe it. I guess um, I don't want to call it hate, but, you know, just the fact that, like I said, somebody posted the other day on Twitter or tweeted. It was like, you know, have you seen that, that I guess, that gif of like, there's a car driving down the street and hits a trash can and the trash can kind of goes flying. Mm -hmm. Like somebody's like live footage of a car hitting Kyle Kuzma and, you know, like basically calling him total trash. And I just, I don't know. I I don't agree with that sentiment. Like obviously is Brandon Ingram right now, like having a better season than Kuzma. Yeah. Like, do I think Brandon Ingram will be a better player than Kuzma? Like, absolutely. Like I loved Brandon Ingram. Like I still think he's a great player, and I I want him and Lonzo Ball to do incredibly well in, in New Orleans. Like I really like them both as players. Even this notion that oh Kyle Kuzma is just terrible, I, I don't really believe that he's like the worst player in the league. Like I would rather have him than not have him. And I don't know. I think unfortunately for Kyle Kuzma, I feel like he's been in a lot of lineups that are very I don't know disadvantageous for him. The fact that he's played so many minutes with Rondo, I think, really hurts him. And I think. Kuzma's having a little bit of that aspect of a Chris Bosh or Kevin Love situation where obviously he is not as good as they were in their prime before they joined up with LeBron, but just this kind of thing of a really, I don't know, volume score kind of being marginalized after joining up with LeBron and a superstar. I kind of feel like that's kind of what's happened to Kuzma. Like I, I would definitely hold, if there was a really obvious good trade that you could make you know, and get rid of Kuzma. Like, you know, for example, if the Kings this summer, if it was definitive, they're like, okay, we're going to, we're going to move on from uh, Bogdanovich. And they were like, we want Kuzma, whoever you draft in this draft and, you know, whatever, Danny Green. Like I would say, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe we can make that trade, but you know, something like Danny Green, DeMarcus Cousins and Kuzma for Marcus Morris. And I saw some Laker fans were like, oh, we should make that trade. I'm thinking, why? Like, Mm-hmm. You think Marcus Morris is better than Danny Green and Kuzma? Like, I don't even think that that's even true. I'd rather have Kuzma and Danny Green than Morris. Oh, yeah, especially when you when you figure factor in the contracts, right? I mean, figure, you know, you're talking about what may just be a half of a season of Marcus Morris compared to, and here's what we have to weigh when you're looking at these Kuzma trades, is he could legitimately be in Los Angeles for the next 10 years, right? If he does well and if you if you continue to re-sign him and bring him back, he could be a Laker for his entire career. Now, maybe that's unlikely in today's NBA, but that's what you have to weigh when you're looking at this trade. It's not just, it's not this season only, even if the Lakers are contending for a championship and that's going to carry more weight than anything else, you still have to consider is half of a season of Marcus Morris worth potentially the next 10 years of of Kyle Kuzma. And I know people like to get on his case right now because uh, part of this is 
is really a domino effect from the Kawhi situation over the summer. The Lakers didn't get Kawhi Leonard, and so their margin of error decreased, and that put the pressure onto Kyle Kuzma. Okay, well, hey, if they didn't get Kawhi Leonard, who's going to be their third star? Everybody turns and looks at Kyle Kuzma, and maybe that's not fair. Um, He certainly isn't going to shy away from anything like that. That's not his personality type. When Kawhi chose the Clippers, Kyle Kuzma instantly had a lot more thrust upon him. A lot, a lot more expectation put on on him to rise up and be that third star. And then he spent most of his summer injured, um, and so he didn't really get to train a lot. He didn't get to work on his on his game a whole lot. And then it took time to adjust to playing alongside LeBron James and Anthony Davis. And look, I'll admit he's frustrating because he's a roller coaster. Yeah. There's games where Kyle Kuzma will put up 18 points and 12 boards, and you think, okay, this is it. This is the Kuzma the Lakers need if he's playing like this. They can win a championship. Then the next night he'll come out and he'll score four points. And it's that up and down effect that is kind of maddening for for fans. And it's frustrating. And I understand why. But we also have to keep in mind these guys, they're not finished products. Okay, younger players. And even at 24. And and you get the people that hop online and they say, oh, those are just excuses and everything. I mean, look, yeah, at some point this is a results-oriented league. But you also have to understand that a player like Kyle Kuzma – is he still has value. He's still very talented. Even if things aren't clicking right now, that doesn't mean that's what he's going to look like next year. We've seen flashes of brilliance. We've seen moments where things look like they click for him, where things look like uh, like what we thought we would see out of Kyle Kuzma. And you say, okay, this is, this is the guy that the Lakers needed. Um, so just because he's not having success so far this season doesn't mean you just write the guy off completely. If we think back... You know, Brandon Ingram's rookie season, he rated out as one of the worst players in the NBA. If you go into any of the advanced analytics, and now he's an all-star. These guys aren't stagnant. They can they can change. And, you know, maybe Kyle Kuzma's ceiling isn't as high as somebody else's because he is a little bit on the older side of the of the spectrum. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that he's just somebody to to write off as as frustrating as his game can be at times this season. Well, I mean, I think even this whole idea, too, it's like, oh, well, Bogdanovich, like, Mm -hmm. he's so much better than this and that. And yeah, like, if you had asked me, like, right now, if the Lakers, all things being, you know, all things being equal, I'd rather have Bogdanovich right now or Mm -hmm. Kuzma right now, I would probably choose Bogdanovich at this very moment. But something that, for some reason, I don't know why a lot of fans kind of just gloss over is, like, Bogdanovich is three years older than Kuzma. Bogdanovich is 27 years old and, like... But he healed is like 27 or 28, and he didn't really hit his stride till he was like 25, 26. And I mean, do I do I think that Kyle Kuzma is going to be as good as Buddy Healed? I mean, I would realistically say no. But I mean, if the expectations for Kuzma is he's a player that gets paid, you know, 13 million dollars a year, that can average, you know, 16 points off the bench and be efficient, and grab rebounds. If that's your expectation, and have him be like, you know the sixth best player on a championship team or seventh best player then like i definitely think we have that or maybe even like i don't know maybe the fourth highest scorer on a champion i mean right now if the lakers win a title right now he'll be the third highest scorer on the team like i don't know i i just feel like there is a little bit of an over exaggeration about how bad he is and i mean there's like you said there's been games this season where i mean even though i just said that i don't think rondo's really good for kuzma in general but that game where we beat the Thunder last, when LeBron and Davis both didn't play, like Kuzma looked really good that game. Mm-hmm. Like I thought he looked good, and I don't know, maybe someone could say, well, it was just one game, but I mean, Kuzma's had several games this season where you look back and you're like, he did pretty well. Like I mean, Christmas Day, didn't he score like twenty points in the first half, or something yeah. like that? Like yeah, he has points where you think you're like, wow, like he's pretty good. I mean, like not like an all star good, but he's good. And I, I, I kind of think, you know, some people say it's like, well. You know, they look at, like, the Clippers, or I guess mostly the Clippers, and they're like, well, the Clippers have all this and blah, 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 this other stuff, and, you know, they're going to beat the Lakers because of that. I've always kind of maintained that I think if the Lakers win or lose to the Clippers, it's going to come down to, are LeBron and Davis better than Kawhi and Paul George? Like, if LeBron and Anthony Davis are better than them, then we should win. I mean, that's two, just two-fifths of the player on the court for us are going to be LeBron and Davis. I mean... I don't know. I, I just kind of maintain that kind of thought. but And that kind of actually leads a little bit to this other kind of, I guess, idea or topic that I want to bring up a little bit is, mm-hmm. I guess, the idea of, like, how good is Anthony Davis? And, like, I guess from, like, a historical standpoint or even, like, top in the league right now. So, like, obviously a lot of pundits still say something like, well, 
the Lakers have two of the top five or six best players. And I always think it's interesting the numbers that are thrown out. Sometimes I'll I'll hear people say oh, two of the best seven best players. Mm-hmm. And I started to think, I'm like, okay. Like, in my opinion, I, I kind of really believe that right now it's LeBron, Giannis, and Kawhi are like at the top. And I think there's like a little bit of a level between them and where Davis is. So I, I personally would put Davis as the fourth best player in the league right now. Do you think that there is a little bit of that, a little bit of a gap between Giannis, LeBron, and Kawhi in Davis? Or do you think Davis isn't exactly in their same class? The more I've watched AD this season, and by the way, he's he's incredible. There's no question there. But the more I see him as kind of a 1B type player, uh, and that's not to say he's not a superstar. I think he very much is a superstar. Um, but I, I do think he is kind of in that, that other tier. Um, it, it's an oversimplification, but I think he's – Pow Gasol to LeBron's Kobe. I think that's I think that's what we're seeing here. What we're seeing play out, and um, and that's you know I'm not saying that Pow is as good as Anthony Davis or anything. I'm just talking about the the general dynamic. Um, and, and part of that part of that is is just kind of the the team impact on the offensive end. Anthony Davis doesn't have the same kind of impact on the offensive end of the floor as like a LeBron James does, obviously. Um, and, and also when you look at just superstar status. What Anthony Davis does really, really well isn't the type of thing that necessarily is going to get a ton of publicity. And I mean, look, he can he can roll to the basket hard. He can dunk the ball. He can get hot from three like we saw against the Denver Nuggets. Uh, he can do those sorts of things. His turnaround game is so so right in the paint. Um, he can do some good things there. But where he really excels is in the last, what, two, three minutes on the on the defensive end. You know, we talk about these clutch plays. Right, these plays that are um, iconic. You know, the the shot goes up as the ball's just as the ball leaves the guy's fingertips. The buzzer sounds and time stands still as the ball floats through, through the air and swishes through the net. Right, like that's NBA basketball at its best. Right, those are those unforgettable moments. And so we remember the players that provide those moments, that provide those those clutch shots. Um, you know, LeBron has had plenty of those. Kobe Bryant had had tons of those. Right, the the big time otherworldly displays of talent. Damian Lillard going crazy this season and hitting, you know, 35 points in however many games in a row he he did it. Um, Anthony Davis makes plays like that, but he does it on the defensive end. And so it's a little bit different. You'll see him just make an absolutely insane rotation. He'll come from out of nowhere. He'll just envelop a, a, drive, uh, a drive to the basket, totally stop it. Doesn't mean it's a giant fly swap block out of bounds or anything like that. Sometimes he just goes up two hands and he and he contests a shot. He does something that is a, a superstar level on the defensive end of the floor, and it's just as clutch as coming up with that, you know, that buzzer beating shot, but it doesn't get nearly the publicity. So I think that's a little bit at play here too, where where AD doesn't have as much stock as a superstar as maybe some other guys might, like a, like say a Luka Doncic, uh, because he impacts the game in a different way that's not quite as as media friendly or as as friendly to the the casual fan sitting at home watching on TV. Uh, but I, I think he is in terms of his overall impact. He's just as good as any of those guys. Uh, I do see him as like you said the, the, that one tier below. Sorry, that's my my long winded way of explaining where I would put. Anthony Davis in a in a ranking. Yeah, and what makes Davis so I guess unique, like, cause I like the same thing with like with what you're saying. I mean, I've seen far more Anthony Davis this season than I've ever seen in his career before, and I mean, he'll have nights, yeah, where he looks incredible. But I don't know what it is. I I, I mean, I mean, I don't know if it's just my opinion or not. And I've talked to friends about this, and they kind of agree with this assessment. But there just seems to be something different between when LeBron's on the court, even at 35. Than Davis right now. Mm-hmm. Like, there's just something about when you see LeBron where you're like, I mean, there's times, I mean, I'm sure you've had this happen even this season where you're just watching this guy and you're like, I think I might actually be watching the best player ever. And I mean, I'm not saying that he's better than Michael Jordan. I mean, I'm not saying any of that stuff, but like, there's just times where you're like, this dude just looks incredible. And I honestly thought even for that all-star game in the fourth quarter, I mean, I know Kawhi won the, the like the finals or the all-star award, you know, the Kobe Bryant award. Right. But honestly, at the end of the game, I was like, LeBron looks like he's the best player on both. Like he's the best player on the court right now, and that in the like the last quarter of that game, especially the last like whatever it was in real time, five minutes or whatever it was. But yeah, I just I feel like when I see LeBron on the court and I see Davis on the court, it, it to me it just I don't know. LeBron just looks at a higher level than Davis. Like I, I truly believe that. Like I still think 
that LeBron's the best player in the league right now, I feel like somebody kind of has to dethrone him. For I mean, if if the Clippers beat LeBron and the Lakers this season, like if Kawhi is better than LeBron and they beat him, then maybe you could say, okay, fine, maybe now Kawhi has surpassed LeBron. Or if Giannis and the Bucks beat the Lakers, and it's like, okay, maybe you could say Giannis. If Giannis plays better than LeBron, you could say, okay, Giannis is better. But at least as of right now, I mean, I, I kind of still think it's LeBron. And I don't know, in some weird way, like, do I want Davis to stay? Absolutely. And I want LeBron to stay too. But I wonder if it's going to, like, impact Davis almost negatively, I guess, to win with LeBron. Because, yeah, like, he... He certainly. I mean, I know he's leading the Lakers in almost every statistical category, but I don't know. I guess maybe my eyes just tell me that LeBron is he's the best player on the team and he's the leader of the team. So know. you're thinking you're thinking like AD isn't going to get credit if the Lakers win because LeBron's on the team. Is that that? Yeah, what you're I guess. Saying? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, in a sense, I think LeBron is going to get far more credit than Davis will get. Um, to a degree, and I think I think LeBron would go out of his way to try to to mitigate that and we've seen that so far right i mean look what was one of the first things LeBron, that lebron did when it came to bringing anthony davis in was go to management and say hey i want to run the offense through anthony davis now clearly that hasn't really happened the offense runs through through <laughs> yeah. lebron still but he has the goal of getting anthony davis going um he wanted to give him his jersey right yeah. he wanted to give 23 to him uh it, lebron has made a conscious effort to make sure that anthony davis understands that He's not. He is not hanging on to that torch. He is very willing to pass that torch to to Anthony Davis. That doesn't mean LeBron is taking a back seat or anything like that. Because, like you said, he's incredible. He's amazing. Um, he he runs the offense. So when he's not out there, things struggle. I mean, things are. It's a it's a challenge when LeBron isn't isn't on the floor, and it's not the same with uh, with Davis. But all that being said, you know, I, I think that that LeBron will go out of his way to make sure that Anthony Davis feels respected and feels like he's definitely part of things and he'll be making sure everybody understands how integral he is. And look, the the reality is that LeBron is 35, right? There's only there's only so long that LeBron can continue defying father time. And that's maybe it's not next season. Maybe it's not the season after. I mean, as far as we know, LeBron is probably mortal, but nobody's really sure at this point but at some point it's going to really become anthony davis's team and so um i think the time for him to shine is, is going to be there the time for it to be his team and him to be the alpha and all of that will be there and for the time being he seems to be enjoying playing playing with lebron so i'm not i'm not too worried about it like stunting the career of anthony davis or anything at 26 he still has plenty of time to to build his legacy just like you know kobe had had time to build out his legacy even though uh, you know, he had Shaq for all of those years, and then he got the post Shaq years to go and show everything that he did. I think Anthony Davis will have that opportunity as well. And for right now, he's enjoying winning because when he was by himself in New Orleans, that 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 wasn't happening. Yeah, and I, I think for Davis, I mean, at least one good thing about his abilities is that, like, like even though, like, yeah, we both agree that he's on that little lower tier. I don't think that he's on that lower tier because of his talent or his body or his physicality. I think it's just like a little bit of a mental barrier. So I, in my opinion, again, I mean, I'm no like psychiatrist or anything or psychologist, but I almost wonder that if, I don't know, like, you know, there's all that talk about how Dwayne Wade taught LeBron how to win and be a champion. Mm -hmm. Like, I wonder if Davis, if he can learn that from LeBron, can that kind of catapult him to that top tier? And then I guess it kind of goes into this other idea that I've, I've kind of thought about this quite a bit this season is that like, where can Davis, like, is there a way for Davis in his career, can he crack, let's say, the top, I don't know, 20 best players ever? Like, do you think, is there a roadmap that in your mind that you think he could follow to get on that path? Yeah, yeah, I think that, that there is. Um, if, you, if you want to put him into that top 20 all-time discussion, and I think it starts with what his goal was heading into this season, and that was to be the defensive player of the year, which I still, I think right now he's probably the the leader i think he's probably the favorite to be the defense i haven't looked at the you know the vegas odds or anything like that but i'd imagine he'd have to be if not the favorite at least one of them to be the defensive player of the year um he's made some some incredible plays and so you rack up some awards like that um then if you win some championships with lebron and then win some without you know maybe the lakers rebuild in the post lebron days and they can build something around davis yeah i think they're the potential is still there um it's not quite you know, like if he had three championships under his belt already, 
and you know like Kobe did at, at the at the point when he was 26 uh, then you're you're already talking about okay this is going to be a Hall of Fame player you know no question he's clearly top 15 or whatever at this point and then he's only just kind of adding to that legacy from here on out Anthony Davis isn't in that space but uh, given his age he still has plenty of time plenty of time to cement that legacy, especially if he can be part of a, a prolonged period of success for the Lakers. Because if there's one thing that we that we found is that the best way to to gain that kind of legacy in the NBA is to be successful as a Laker. That will guarantee that you're getting the coverage. That will guarantee that you're getting that spotlight on you, and that people step up and and recognize uh, your achievements. Yeah, I mean, I certainly believe that for Davis, like what you're saying. I mean, you win a few titles, like even if, you know, he wins three titles over his career, a couple titles at least, and then you win those individual accolades, like Defensive Player of the Year, you make, you know, four more All-NBA first teams. You win, I mean, I think you'd have to probably win at least one MVP. And yeah, I, I th- really do think there's a roadmap. I mean, I, I think he's great. I mean, even though I, I just said, like, you know, I might have said some things that might have sounded disparaging, like, I really do think he is like an amazing player. I just think that, I don't know, I, I think there is a little bit of that last step for him to go, but I certainly mm-hmm. think he could take it. And I mean, even if you go back, I think Kawhi Leonard is 29 this year. He's either, I can't remember if he's exactly my age or one year older than I am, but I know we're almost exactly the same age. And even Kawhi, like you go back, you know, so to 2017, like, yeah, he had a really good season, but like, I don't know. I mean, so that would have made him the same age as Davis, but the year before that in 2016, like the Spurs after having like won whatever 67 regular season games, like they had an epic collapse against the Thunder and like Kawhi Leonard was easily the third best player in that series. If not, maybe even the fourth, I don't know. Even all this talk now about how good Kawhi is like, it really hasn't been that long of a period of time that he's really been looked upon as this great of a player. So I don't know. I I definitely, I think Davis has that potential and I don't know. I I think I definitely think he has an incredibly bright future, but I don't know. I guess I was thinking about this during the all-star game that obviously we saw for the, the lineup or the closing lineup for team LeBron, you know, you see Chris Paul who should have been Mm -hmm. a Laker if you know, that trade wasn't illegally blocked. And then you see Kawhi Leonard on the court and you're like, man, what could have been with Kawhi LeBron and Davis and then, yeah, obviously that didn't happen. And, you know, we, although we would have had the biggest big three ever, but do you, uh, do you put any stock, I guess, in this notion? Yeah. Of Giannis potentially coming to Lakers. Like, do you think that could happen? And what kind of, what would that look like? Giannis and Davis together for, I don't know, in their primes for five years together. What do you think that would look like? And do you think we have a chance? Um, so I was breaking down the math on this earlier. So LeBron's going to be, um, uh, LeBron will be hitting, could be hitting free agency in 2021. Um, he'll have a player option there. And then you also have Giannis. And let's say, I mean, Giannis had that that comment the other day, right, where he said uh, about how much he would love to play with his brothers. Uh, and he said in Milwaukee or in L.A., something to that effect, which, of course, that made Lakers fans' ears perk up and everybody's all excited. Oh, Giannis to, to the Lakers, right? And then fans you know, for, of every other team around the league are, are roll, <laughs> rolling their eyes right now. Uh, but... It could that could it really happen? Looking at the numbers, it's it's tough, right? And like mm-hmm. if the Lakers re-sign Anthony Davis and they bring him back on a max deal, and you still have LeBron, who has said many times over the years that he's not taking a penny less than, than the max, and you know based on how he's playing right now, projecting out, he'd probably still be a max level player at that at that point. And again, who knows what happens between now and then? And you know, Father Time's undefeated and all that. Even if the Lakers find a way to completely clear their books, I'm talking about the only two players on the team are LeBron and Anthony Davis, and both of them are max deals because you would still have the contract of Lou Aldang, that $5 million would be the last season of that sit on the books. Plus, you've got empty roster slot charges for the 10 spots that the Lakers wouldn't have filled up to, to 12 spots because you would have LeBron and AD taken up two. Uh, that would be almost a million dollars per slot. It's like nine hundred thousand or something like that. So anyway, but bottom line, when you add all of that up, uh, you you come a little bit short of actually being able to offer a max deal to Giannis. Now you can say maybe you can convince LeBron to take less than the max, and then you can bring in Giannis. Something like like you can try to work it around. Uh, but just financially, it's tough to do. Uh, is he going to really turn down like a super max offer from Milwaukee? I mean, look, some players have done it, but Maybe he will, maybe he won't. I'd say it's still probably a long shot, 
But at the same time, you look at the Lakers' contracts and you look at the way they're structured and you look at Danny Green getting two years and Contavious Caldwell-Pope getting two years and and uh, JaVale McGee getting two years and all of these contracts all ending the summer that Giannis is a free agent, I don't think that's a coincidence. So while I won't say that it's it's for sure or even anywhere close to likely, I think that if it's a possibility, the Lakers are setting themselves up to potentially try to make that move. Yeah, I mean, I would. I mean, it seems like I mean from everything you've said and everything that I've just seen online and heard, or just you know, like listening to podcasts and videos and mm-hmm. stuff. I mean, it certainly seems like the Lakers. Yeah, I mean, like you said, I mean, there's no. I mean, no one right now is a front runner. Definitely, that's not the case. I mean, outside of I guess you could say Milwaukee keeping yeah. them. I mean, so that I guess they're the front runners there, but. I definitely think the Lakers are certainly at the table, I would say. Like if Giannis, let's say in the summer of 2021, is going to say, okay, I'm going to actually meet with other teams just to see what they have to say. I certainly think the Lakers are a legitimate option. Sure. And I mean, I don't know. I mean, you're right. Like I've, I've seen that those quotes LeBron said he won't, he won't take any, he won't take any discounts, but I don't know if you're LeBron James and you have this possibility to form that would really be the biggest big three ever. Giannis Davis and himself. I don't know. If you're LeBron, do you say like, hey, you know what? Maybe if I resign and I take a little bit of a haircut and I can get Giannis? I mean, I don't know. That would just be remarkable. Or I mean, I don't know. What if it was something different? What if the Lakers said, Well, you know, if LeBron doesn't want to take a little bit of a discount, but we can get Giannis, I mean, do you move on from LeBron to get Giannis? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess that sounds so greedy to say because we're first in the West and you know, yeah. we're talking about getting Giannis. But like, <laughs> I mean, LeBron doesn't have a no trade clause. So, I mean, theoretically, you could, I don't know. I mean, could you do something weird where it's a sign and trade for Giannis for LeBron? I don't know. I mean, um, like the, the only way they do that is if LeBron requested it. They're not yeah. they're not going to trade him otherwise just because of like the, the backlash for trading, you know, an all time great player who came to your franchise and is you know, really put down roots and done everything he can to to become, you know, part of the, the franchise. I don't think that you you trade LeBron. Look, if he said, please trade me, then maybe you do. Otherwise, I don't think they're trading LeBron. Um, it, it would just set a bad precedent for, for the Lakers. But um, if you could convince him to take a little bit less, OK, you know, maybe you're in business. Look, Anthony Davis sacrificed four million dollars this last summer so that the Lakers would have enough money to go after Kawhi Leonard. And then when they didn't get Kawhi Leonard, AD didn't say, hey, give me my money back. Um, they they spent the money on other free agents. So, look, it's it's possible. It could happen. And, yeah, look, if Giannis, if Giannis doesn't resign with the Bucs, I mean, first of all, that's going to be the red flag, right? If he doesn't take their Supermax offer, the clock's ticking at that point, right? And here's the thing. The Lakers paved the way to Contavious Caldwell-Pope or I'm sorry, to, to LeBron, by getting Contavious Caldwell-Pope. And they developed that relationship. They kind of laid the foundation. So they started working with Rich Paul. So Rich Paul would go tell LeBron, hey, LeBron, like, hey, things are running are running well in L.A. Let's go there, right? Let's let's do this. Um, well, who is it that has a two-way contract with the Lakers right now? Costas Antetokounmpo, who's going to be telling his brother all about it, all about what it's like to be a Laker. So they're, they're building that relationship as much as they possibly can. Um, and that's, that's kind of the Lakers MO. And I don't want to get anybody too excited about, Oh, Giannis is coming or anything like that. It's a ways off from that, but we're seeing the Lakers make the kind of moves, um, that would say that they are serious about at least being an option, um, in case he does become a free agent then. You know, it would be like a, I mean, I guess you could say a sports fear of mine, not like a fear that keeps me up at night, but a thought that I've had, a little bit of especially recently is that if Giannis doesn't sign the contract extension this summer, like you said, and then let's say the Bucks they get panicky because I mean people kind of forget they're still a poverty franchise. I mean they still moved on from Malcolm Brogdon for literally no reason and they wanted to be cheap. So like let's say they freak out a little bit and they say, All right, we gotta get something for Giannis. Like I really hate both of these teams, but I seriously think the Celtics and Warriors I mean, again, I haven't like crunched the numbers. I mean, I actually think you have a show where you crunch the numbers and you do a GM show. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it seems like, from my understanding, like both of those teams could probably realistically trade for Giannis and like keep their main stars. Like, I was thinking about it, like the Warriors, okay, like couldn't they, like this summer, couldn't they trade like 
their first round draft pick this year, which might be whatever the third pick of the draft or the second pick, yeah, whatever it's going right. to be, they could trade that pick, the Timberwolves pick, Andrew Wiggins or Draymond Green. I don't know whichever one you want to say, and then probably some other stuff. I mean, I was thinking like that would be a pretty good offer for Giannis. Maybe you maybe you throw in five picks. I don't know, but five picks and Wiggins or five picks and Draymond for Giannis. I don't know. And then you look at the Celtics and you say, okay, well, the Celtics, I mean, even though they always talk about their draft picks, and I, I seriously don't even know the name of one of the players they drafted in the first round this year because they've all been, they haven't done anything. But I don't know if the Celtics, if they could do, I mean, again, I don't know how the salaries, I mean, obviously the salaries would have to match, but if you could do something like, you know, Brown, Tatum, a bunch of draft picks and whatever else, I mean, could they get Giannis and still have, you know, Kemba Walker, uh, Kemba Walker and, Gordon Hayward, and I mean, I think both of those teams could do it. And I would absolutely hate it if either one of those teams <laughs> would do it. But I think they have a real chance if Giannis was going to get traded. I mean, who do you think, like if Giannis was to get traded this summer, who do you think would be some of the teams that could trade for him and still be competitive after making that deal? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think you hit on a, a couple of them there. The Celtics could do it and still be competitive. Uh, I mean, but at the same time, you know, we're talking about Giannis, who is amazing, right? I mean, look, you you put him on any team in the league, and you're probably talking about at least a playoff team, right? So it's kind of like the LeBron effect, right, where you could have put him anywhere, and and say, and, and some team could convince themselves, okay, we're a title contender just because we've got uh, LeBron James, but uh, Giannis kind of has that too. So you could see teams coming out of the woodwork. But the bigger question is, uh, where would he consider going? And again, we're we're way ahead of ourselves here because he's said. You know, he, he enjoys Milwaukee. He's not uh, – there's no indication that he's trying to leave Milwaukee or anything. But just in terms of hypothetically, if if they did get close to that point and Giannis made it clear that he's not going to come back and so the Bucks are going to trade him, well, every – you know, 29 teams would have offers for, for Giannis, right? 29 teams would be going after him. The bigger question would be where would he want to go? Because that's mm-hmm. the point where the agent gets involved and says, okay, you can trade for us, but – we're not going to resign. Okay, if we if he gets traded somewhere he doesn't want to go, and some team may try to call that bluff, like the Oklahoma City Thunder did with Paul George, or teams may back off, like the Boston Celtics did with Anthony Davis, where Davis told them, "Hey, I'm not going to stay. You can trade for me. I'll play for you for a year, and then I'm gone." And if that's the case, the Celtics don't want to give up their best assets. So that's really the question. It would be if Giannis decides no to Mo- no, I'm not going to Milwaukee. Where is it that he does want to play? Because that would be a major factor in what the offers looked like. But uh, but just off the top of my head, teams that could put together packages, uh, I think the Denver Nuggets have some interesting pieces depending on how Michael Porter Jr. Uh, develops. I think that, like you said, the Warriors have some some really good. Like they could have the number one pick this year. We don't we don't know. Uh, they've got some interesting assets there. You've got uh, the Celtics are another one. There's a number of teams, you know, the uh, the Memphis Grizzlies could get in on it with some picks and some combination of, uh, uh, of I mean, well, you're not going to trade John Morant, but maybe Jaron Jackson Jr. So there's a lot of teams that could get into the mix. Uh, the teams that you probably wouldn't see, like, like the Rockets will try to get involved in just about every trade. I don't really see a team like that as having the assets to go after him. Uh, the Lakers don't really have the assets to go after him in a, in a trade. Uh, but again, the, the big determining factor would be where does he want to play? And if he gives a list of, say, five teams or whatever, then those teams would be the ones that would be you know, most willing to fork over a lot for Giannis. And based on what the Clippers traded for Paul George, um, I can only imagine how many draft picks would have to be be given up in order to get Giannis out to Takumpo. I mean, the team that, I mean, again, obviously, I want him to become a Laker if he was going to leave Milwaukee. But the team, I think, actually, that would be kind of fascinating if they traded for him would be the Nets. Like if the Nets, mm. like like if they kept Durant and Kyrie, and let's say they had to get rid of everybody, Dinwiddie, Karis LeVert, all the guys that like uh, hipster NBA likes, get rid of <laughs> all of those guys. Yeah, you know, like I mean, yeah, on a side note, like you hear, like I swear I've heard those names mentioned so many times in like Ringer podcasts and on yeah. Twitter, and I'm thinking, I'm like, look at their stat lines, and you're like, dude, this guy averages like 15 points. Like what are you talking about? You make it sound like he's an all-star, but regardless – if the Nets, if they traded everything that would require to get Giannis, that big three would actually be very fascinating. Kyrie, Durant, and Giannis. I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't mind that. If they the Nets were able to do that trade, I wouldn't 100% mind that. Like, if Giannis had to go somewhere that wasn't L.A., I'd be okay with that. I mean, yeah, 
him going to the Warriors, Celtics, or Clippers would just, uh, if he went to the Clippers, I think I would I would be a little sick. I think I'd have a <laughs> headache. Like, I was actually at a friend's 4th of July party when Kawhi, when he oh, started yeah. with the Clippers. Like, my friend, he's a huge Laker fan, and I could just see his whole temperament just totally change. It, it, like, yep. Kawhi signing with the Clippers actually ruined that 4th of July party. And, I mean, I live right outside of L.A., like, seriously right outside of LA and like at, like yeah my friend and a couple other the Laker fans there were just like visibly bummed out he destroyed 4th of July Kawhi Leonard actually destroyed my 4th of July like he truly did he, that party was ruined because I think he signed on the 5th he at least destroyed that party like it was but yeah if Giannis went to the Clippers oh my gosh that would just the amount of flack the Lakers would get on Twitter would just Oh my gosh, it would it would give I couldn't even I wouldn't be able to go on Twitter anymore. I would have to stop. Yeah, I, I'm, <laughs> like I mean, okay. First of all, like like maybe that's the new nickname for Kawhi, right? The party ruiner or something or something like that. Kawhi Leonard killed Fourth of July. Um, yeah. So that's that's and you know he planned that. I'm sure, right? He he wanted to try to ruin Lakers fans Fourth of July just like he was trying to ruin their their free agency. Kawhi yeah. Leonard, uh, but uh, he, uh, him going to the Clippers, yeah, that, that's certainly tough. Um, it, it wasn't a great moment for Lakers fans, the Clippers fans who, well, all twelve of them were celebrating. Um, there's no question that there. Clipper Daryl was happy. Yes, yeah. Look, you've seen more Clippers. Clippers fans have become, and I'm sorry, this is a side thing here, but Clippers fans have become more and more of a thing this season. Um, yeah. than we've ever seen in the past. There've been more of them popping up. A lot of them though were just fans of other teams. That really hate the Lakers, and so they said, "Okay, well, I'm going to become a Clippers fan now." But now the Clippers are good. That's that's been um, something that we've seen happen. But the bottom line is that uh, if if Giannis were to go to say the Clippers or or a team like that, yes, it, it would. And I don't think they really have the pieces to trade for him unless they're giving up Paul George or giving up something like that. Uh, I think they gave away so many of their assets in order to get Paul George and uh, and Kawhi. But that's yeah, that's certainly a nightmare scenario. Certainly not something that would be <laughs> that would be fun for Lakers fans, right? No, no question. Twitter is its own world, and I love Twitter, right? I, I love going on to basketball Twitter and all the takes and everything. But I also have to explain a lot of the things that I say more than I would like to, because <laughs> things that are like things that are sarcastic get taken seriously, and people will fire these hot takes at each other. And uh, you know, you you can't even you can't. There's a lot of things that you can't do on there. So I try not to take Twitter too seriously so even if even if twitter is going crazy with a bunch of clippers fans or whatever it's twitter it's it's kind of it's what it's there for and i'm not uh, yeah i i'm not going to be too worried if, if that happens i'd be more concerned with okay well what do the lakers do now if Giannis was a clipper but um yeah again that's that uh, see that's going to keep me up and up tonight now i'm not gonna be able to sleep <laughs> because i'm going to be thinking about oh my gosh Giannis is a, is a clipper that's that's the stuff of nightmares that's for sure it really is. And, you know, there's there's a there's a content creator that works with us on the channel's name is Johnny Arnett. And uh, we were talking about, like, the other day, he and I just had a phone call. We were talking about, um, you know, like, people that follow basketball, like, online. And how, almost in a sense, it, it almost seems like it's a, it almost seems like that could almost be its own, like, thing that's not even connected to the NBA. Like, sometimes there's so many weird inside jokes and analysis and, like, I've seen one kind of recently, this idea of calling uh, Kyle Kuzma the 6'8 Amber Rose. And like, <laughs> you see stuff like this and you're just like, it's like a whole other world. Like it's, and I mean, I, I see, I mean, I see you on Twitter, like you post on a regular basis and like Lakers Nation posts on a regular basis. So you guys are like, you're seeing the comments. It's like people now it's, it's a whole other thing where it's like, you know, you look at like, you know, you, you post something, let's say on, I don't know, like you personally, like you post something on Twitter that, you know. LeBron has the best uh, on-off numbers of all players this season, which I think he does. I think I saw that the other day. Somebody posted that. And then, like, you know, somebody posts something like Skip Bayless saying something like that. And then underneath that's, like, a mock-up of Skip Bayless as a clown. And, like, with the graphics, like, he has, like, yep. the makeup on and stuff. And, like, people that follow this totally know what you're saying. And people that, if they just stumbled upon this, he'd be like, what? what in the world am I looking at now? I'm looking at this guy dressed as a clown. Like, what does this even mean? And like, I don't know, it, it to me, it just seems like following basketball online is just, it almost seems like it's a whole other thing. That's not even, obviously it takes inspiration from the sport, but sometimes it just seems like it takes on a weird life of its own. 
It is. It's incredibly it is kind of fascinating. Its, its world. It, re- it really is. It's it's it, it's its own little world, and you get people that are uh, that are firing off all kinds of different comments and all these these little jokes that you have out there. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, calling someone a clown, or what's the the one that everybody's saying now is the you hate to see it, right? Sorry, sarcastically, yeah. you know, um, and things like that. A, a great example is is this. So. Uh, right after the Lakers beat the Nuggets, like as the final final buzzer sounded, I'm getting ready to do the Lakers Nation post game show, and I just fire off this comment just to be kind of snarky, and I and the the tweet was, uh, the Lakers don't beat good teams, and that was it. That was the tweet because that was all we've heard, right? And so they had just beaten the Denver Nuggets, and everything's everything you know was it was just me kind of snapping back at the, at the people that kept saying that over and over again. Okay, well they just beat a good team, and so you know that that tweet just blew up. Like went went crazy, and days later, I'm getting people that are responding to me, with like with all of this anger and all of this rage. You don't know what you're talking about. They're 500 against blah 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 blah. blah. It was a joke. <laughs> that was not how. Sometimes we lose we lose context of the of the moment on there, and uh, and so it's like I said, it's it's its own little world, and so you just kind of take it you take it all with a grain of salt. But at the same time, there's been there's also some great things that happen there on social media as well. Um, and so I don't want to say that I treat Twitter as like a, just a joke or I brush it all off or anything like that because I don't. I've, you know, I've seen all kinds of comments thrown at me in a negative light. I've seen all kinds of, of stuff, uh, crazy things being said, being said to me about different takes that I've had and stuff like that. And I can just brush all that off. But at the same time, there's also been some very, very positive things. Um, you know, my... Uh, my grandfather passed away uh, a couple weeks ago, and so I mentioned it on Twitter. And the outpouring of support, you know, like even you know Jared Dudley reached out and and was uh, was offering his condolences and and things like you know just um, little things like that. And when Kobe passed away, right, like everybody was was supporting each other and helping each other and and all of that. So I do want to highlight that too. Like if we're uh, Twitter can be a weird place. And you can have all this craziness going on, but it can also be a, a very cool place where people can be reasonable and and level headed uh, until until they're not, until things get crazy again, because eventually they will. Yeah, and I think you know, like when you said that whole thing, like oh, they don't beat teams that are above five hundred. I mean, that was the whole joke. Is this whole season is the Laker haters are like, well, the Lakers are, you know, they lost to the Raptors mm-hmm. and this, and the Clippers and this other good team. In the beginning of the season, it's like, oh, well, we can only beat bad teams. And I think actually after the conclusion of that Nuggets win, we actually have more wins now over the elite teams, wherever you want to say, or the f- teams over five hundred than the Clippers even do. No, but that but that doesn't matter. That doesn't count. It's only the it's only wins over the Clippers and the Bucks now. That's that's what it is now. <laughs> it's yeah, not. Or even, it's, you're not getting credit for beating the beating the Nuggets anymore. You're not getting credit for beating any of the other good teams. That's that's what we're seeing now from kind of the Laker haters is. Is oh well, but they they're zero two against the Clippers, and they didn't beat you know the Celtics. They're gonna cherry pick the the stats that they want to pick, and just like you know, Lakers supporters will cherry pick the stats that, that we want to, and and all of that. Um, yeah, that's just that's just the way it goes. But yes, they are the idea that they can't beat good teams is overblown. Have they lost some games against some good teams? Yes, but I think I would be more alarmed if they were losing games against bad teams personally. Yeah, and I mean, I feel like you know, too, something that like for some reason people just kind of like you know, brush under the carpet, but like, I mean, the Clippers got like obliterated by the Bucks one game and they lost to the Bucks another game. Like, I believe in the second game they played the Bucks, they lost, they were down by like almost 40 points at one point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, but it's the Lakers and people, just like people have grown up loving the Lakers, there's a lot of people who have grown up hating the Lakers and people don't like that the Lakers have this massive fan base and that when the Lakers go on the road, half the fans in the arena are Lakers fans and, and all of that. And so there's, there's going to be that backlash. There's going to be people looking to to fire off a comment anytime something bad happens related to the Lakers. And as much as we can say, oh, it's annoying and all of that, I think it's also kind of endearing in a way, and it's in- indicative of the impact that the Lakers have had. Because the worst thing is when somebody just doesn't care, right? The Clippers lose by 40, and it's crickets. No one cares, right? Like, the, some Clippers fans are upset. Some people may say a few things, so I shouldn't say no one cares. But you don't get that kind of reaction. If that was the Lakers, people would be losing their minds, right? It, it would be the the major topic on all of the national shows was would be the Lakers just lost by 40. You know, is the sky falling? Um, and the, the other day before the Lakers took on the, the Warriors when they were in Golden State, 
we brought a bunch of Lakers fans up there to the game. Lakers Nation did. And uh, Kendrick Perkins was there doing the pregame. And he brought out this big meter of, you know, the panic meter for the Lakers and how panicked should the team be right now and all People aren't going to do that when the Clippers lose by 40, but it's a sign of how much people care about the Lakers, whether they love them or they hate them. And uh, and so I think that if we want to spin it that way, it's a, it's still a positive. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. Yeah, I mean, when the Clippers, when they got blown out, I don't think the media even talked about it. But yeah, I mean, for us, it's, oh, we lost to the Clippers on Christmas Day by whatever it was, five points or six points. It's like, oh my gosh, the sky is falling. But uh, I want to ask you real quick with just one last, I guess, question is for the Lakers, what's your prediction for the rest of the season? Like how many wins did they get? And do you think we can win a title this year? All right. So they've got 29 games left right now. They're at, what are they at? 42 wins at the moment. I'm going to say they get to 60. And that wasn't my prediction heading into the season. I was saying they would hit about 52. So this is, uh, I mean, it's been a good season. Um, there is a really tough stretch. There's a stretch of about eight games coming up here in the middle of March. That's tough. It's one game after another after another of some of the top teams in the league. And then after that, it lights up quite a bit. So if the Lakers start going to load management or something, I could see them falling short of that prediction. But yeah, I'll say I'll say they win 18 out of the next 29 games. And and part of that will be due to you know load management and that type of thing where they'll be kind of resting some guys to get ready for the playoffs. Um, and, and I think that'll be good enough to secure the number one seed in the Western Conference. Uh, Can they win a championship this year? Yeah, I think they can. You mentioned it earlier that you think in order to beat like a team like the Clippers, LeBron and Anthony Davis have to be better than Kawhi and Paul George. Um, I I also think that we need to throw in that the Lakers bench needs to be able to play the benches of other teams even. And that's something that has been kind of hit and miss this season. Um, We've seen a Lakers bench squad that has a negative net rating. And I'm talking about that main bench unit uh, that has Dwight and uh, and Caruso, and he's been great, but Caruso and KCP and, and Kuzma and all those players, um, that one has a negative net rating right now. So getting that bench unit to be able to at least play even with their opponents, I think that's going to be really critical. Uh, it's not – like if they had gotten Kawhi, the margin of error would be, would be very wide, right? Uh, they didn't get Kawhi. They didn't find a perfect trade at the deadline. They haven't found success yet on the buyout market. So I think the margin of error is is pretty slim. But yes, I think this team can win a championship. But like I said, I think it's going to take LeBron and Anthony Davis being better than whoever the other team stars are and the Lakers bench being able to play the other team's bench even. I think that's a very fair assessment. I think, I mean, it's totally possible. I mean, I don't know. I I agree with what you're saying. I think we'll win around 60 wins. I don't know. To be fair, I feel like I like our chances as much as anybody else's to win a title, to be honest. I mean, for the Clippers, I mean, yeah, are they deep? Yeah, but if you're the Clippers... The guy that has to be great is Paul George. And Paul George hasn't won a playoff series since his massive like leg injury all those years ago. And he had double shoulder surgery this past summer and he's injured again. So you have I mean, your bench could be great, but I mean you're not gonna beat LeBron, Anthony Davis, and the Lakers with Kawhi Leonard and Landry Shamit as your second best player. It's just not gonna happen unless Kawhi Leonard it takes it to Super Saiyan form. He he can't do it by himself. And I don't know. I, I agree with you, though. I think some players have to tighten it up and be better. You're right. Like, I mean, even though I know people are like, well, KCP's good now. Like, there's still times where, like, he'll mess up here or there. And Bradley, sometimes I hate his shot selection sometimes. Where he's shooting this horrible mid-range jumper shots where you're like, dude, why not take two steps forward or two steps back? Two steps back to three. Two steps forward, mm-hmm. your likelihood of hitting it goes up dramatically. But... I think we have a good chance this year. I I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously you got LeBron Davis and you're going to win, you know, 60 wins or get 60 wins. I mean, you definitely have a chance, but well, Trevor, yeah, definitely, man. This spent a little longer than I initially pitched to you and I apologize for that, but yeah, man, how can we follow everything that you're doing online and how can we keep up with all the content that you guys are producing? Hey, that, that was my fault. You got me talking Lakers ba- basketball. I started ranting and raving, and so I, I pushed this way, way longer than I should have. So I am I should apologize to you there. Um, but as far as where you can find my my work, uh, the Lakers Nation YouTube channel has a lot of my, well, all of my, my video work goes up there in addition to a few other places. Um, you can find all of my analysis on trades and trade rumors and all, all you know, all the different rumors out there. Uh, is there. We also do the Lakers Nation post game show, which we st- stream live across YouTube, uh, Facebook, and Periscope after every single Lakers game. You can come join in the topic in the the talk there, and we respond directly to all of the the fans who are, are watching the show. 
Um, so we've got that as well. You can find my written work at LakersNation.com and follow me on social media at Trevor underscore Lane on Twitter. And I am trying. I am really putting effort into my Instagram account now, and I'm trying to make that better. It's not natural to me. It's something that's that's taking a little bit of work, but you can find me on Instagram at Trevor Lane NBA. Well, great. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm not much of an Instagram guy, so I definitely, I can't cast dispersions at all, but definitely. Well, Trevor, thank you so much, man, for coming on. And yeah, let's touch base after the season's over and let's see if, let's see if our hopes and dreams have come to fruition. I guess as long as the Clippers don't win, that'll be the second best win after us winning. If we win, that's best. Second best in my mind of the Bucks. So, all right, Trevor, I guess I'll, I'll talk to you later, man. All right. That sounds good. Thanks. We want to thank today's sponsors again, the Tax Defense Group and Rider Junkie. You can contact the Tax Defense Group at 800-850-7973. And Rider Junkie's phone number again was 805-587-7966.